can make it clear. Order. 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 Order
social structures, like we're talking about cultural capital as well. And these are things that need to be addressed, I think. If, if it's occurring on such a widespread basis, this is something that needs to be addressed through government. Is that a fair enough point that the government needs to step in and do more here? I mean, we had, we had a case, didn't we, just recently, a uh, story this week, where solo mums are shoplifting more in Christchurch. And, and, and the reason is being that it's been driven by need, not a greed element there. We do have a high level of poverty, don't we? Uh, you, look, undoubtedly there is a level of poverty in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I mean, that, that goes without, you know, I mean, you, you just can't deny that. Yep. However, um, it, going back to your original question, I think that is the responsibility of both the parents and the state. Yeah, Absolutely. well, let's get into it's that. Everybody's where, where, where responsibility. Is it? Where, where is it? Where, I mean, it's my responsibility yep. to ensure that my babies go to school sure. fed. But it's also my responsibility to ensure that my neighbours are okay as well too, and my street is okay, and my, you know, my my whānau, whānui are okay. Yeah. It is everybody's responsibility. But first and foremost, it is my responsibility to ensure that my children are fed. Yep. Yep. And then if I am unable to do that, then there must be somewhere for me to go to be able to ensure that they are fed. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. But in, in South Auckland, there is a high level of personal debt. We're carrying high levels of personal debt yeah, that yeah. we should not be carrying amongst families. And this personal debt are on things like cars, yep. are on things like 48-inch television sets. Yep. You know, are on $5,000 lounge suites. Yeah. They are not yeah. the type of debt like mortgages, mm. you know, th those types of debt that are quite healthy debt. Mm. They're not that but People but I, I think getting into debt a lot this, more This easier, is symptomatic of New Zealand society in general. I mean, if you read the IMF report on New Zealand, mm. uh, our economy, what the problem actually is, is the level of private debt among the middle classes. Yeah. So to put, position it as a poor problem, to position it as, um, you know, I, I, I don't know whether you were specifically saying this, but I think that some people might get the impression of some of the things that you said, that this is a, a Māori and Polynesian problem. We know that 50% of those parents were poor kids of Pākehā. Sure. We know that 40% sure. of them are in full-time work. So I think that this is something that absolutely needs to be addressed and shouldn't so, be slanted so, so, as... So poverty isn't just Māori and Pacific Island, which is the way it's always sold in the, in the media. It's actually quite widespread across New, New, the New Zealand demographic, right? Well, obviously. Yeah. Well, yes. given that the majority of those that, that are in poverty in South Auckland, they are Māori Pacifica. And so that's the perspective in which I am coming from. Right, right. And, you know, um, I will make no apologies for saying that the majority of us in South Auckland are Māori and Pacific Islanders. Yes, they are. And the majority of us in South Auckland, Māori and Pacifica, are in poverty. And I'm not going to make any apology for that. And so um, is it... Is it, you know, a brown issue? Well, in South Auckland sure. and in Mangere, sure. yeah, absolutely, it is. Is it an issue in Christchurch and some of the areas Māori Pacifica? Perhaps not. It might be a, it might be a parking issue. But right now in Mangere, it is my issue, and it is a Māori and Pacifica issue. Do you think that it is too easy to get into debt? Does does that side of things need to be tightened up? Well, you know, I mean. Um, yes, the Labour, the Labour, um, when the Labour Party had introduced um, um, loan shark amendments, they didn't mm. go far enough, did they? Well, and then you know, um, Sam Lautowinga has got a private members bill in yep. as well too. So I think that there is goodwill amongst all the parties to yep. be able to address this issue. But you know, our personal debt is an old one. Yeah. You know, and I absolutely agree with Phoebe that yep. it, it seems to be entrenched in our society anyway. Yep. That personal debt seems to be the way to go. And quite frankly, it some kind of do, it does attach itself to a, a nations that. Are beneficiary dependent. Phoebe, how important is this I policy? I disagree with that. I mean, <laughs> the United States is the ultimate example of that in the subprime housing crisis. So they did lose money, yeah. Right. <laughs> how, how important is this policy repositioning for David Shearer and the Labour Party? How, well, this is this is quite important for the feed the kids element, isn't well, it? Well, it's you know stealing policy off mana, but I think it allows them to attack national on a number of fronts where right. they are quite frankly weak. I mean, yep. because it, you know what we are seeing at the moment is the routine disregardment of you know reports that are done. I mean, see Russell Norman yesterday. Um, attacking Bill English on the 2,200 uh, people that will have their benefits halved. Mm. And, um, you know, the, the retort is that there is no such paper. Well, it's in the cabinet paper that, you know, gets lodged. And this is something that we're seeing again and again. English and Joyce on, you know, the argument that 
unemployment has gone down. Yep. Okay, when that is in the household labour force survey that has been um, contested. Yep. So I think this is a serious issue that needs to be addressed. Final question to both of you, can hungry children learn? Oh, look, you know, I was a former school teacher. Yep. Of course, um, hungry children can't learn. So do we need more of a reaction than just the charities? Well, it, there does need to be a more coordinated approach. What I would actually like to see, you know, as a former school teacher is um, meals in schools. Right, right. So you would be sort of that? Where, where do you think? Uh, hungry children, they learn? No, they can't learn. I think that the cost of feeding them is actually relatively cheap. And there's been many studies done on this where, you know, it's as much as seven times payback mm. um, for every dollar that is spent at that age. Thank you, panel. Moving on with issue two. After state-sanctioned birth control, solo mothers back to work when their child turned one. Drug testing, warrant arrest, disqualifying announcements on beneficiaries over the last month comes the latest list of disqualifications, which include not enrolling your children into early education or with a GP. Uh, Phoebe, how does punishing the child for the sins of the parent how does that work as social policy? Well, this really worries me. I mean, I was listening to national radio the other day where they had people from budgeting advice talking about how, um, you know, the 15 hours early childhood education a week is actually quite a high cost mm. for somebody that, say, is on a benefit. I mean, mm. I believe there was a New Zealand Herald article where they were talking about someone that had their child enrolled for nine hours That's and right, they could yeah. only just afford it. Yeah. Um, so I think that there are issues around that and reducing the benefit by 50%. I mean, that's something that um, they're talking about uh, with the policy on drug testing as well. I mean, this is punitive on the children. Mm. Yes. Cla Claudette, is there a double standard here with these social obligations? If non-beneficiaries don't do all of these things, they'll still receive state support like working for families, won't they? So what's the question? Well, do you think that it's discriminatory against beneficiaries? The argument is these social obligations only apply to beneficiaries, not to other 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 New Zealanders. Yeah. Look, um, again, because you know I live in South Auckland, yeah. uh, there is a real um, there's real intent to for Fano to send their children to um, ECEs. Hmm. Not what I think we're looking at is the figures that go to Parker ECEs, yep. but there's a huge uptake in the number of Pacifica sending them to um, Samoa and um, Kohanga and Puna Reo yep. as well too in the Cook Island ones and there's been a slight increase in the Kohanga Reo. So I think that um, amongst our farm and, and they are very cost effective, yep. so the, the, the costs a relative to the income of the of those families. Okay. Yep. So what I think we're seeing is not the uptake into Parkia ECEs by right. by families out in South Auckland, but, do you but a huge increase in the in the Tongan. You know, this week was um, last week was yep. Tongan Language Week as well too. Yep. So you know the number of Tongan language nests that were. Um, that came out to, to show the development of amongst um, yep. that community was huge. But do you think these social obligations are only placed on beneficiaries? Why aren't enrolling your children into these early education Yeah, I think that's systems? absolutely and right. Why, it should why be across it, the board. Yeah, so, so, so absolutely we're only focusing on board. beneficiaries. We're talking that is about, yeah, absolutely. If, if we're talking about um, education for our tamariki, it should yep. be across the board, absolutely. Mm. Phoebe, what about the social obligations the state are responsible for. I mean, with the highest inequality rate in our history, aren't many of the current beneficiary restrictions breaching those social obligations? Why are we only hearing about beneficiary social obligations? Well, because I think that, you know, this is a kind of dog whistle approach that we're getting. I mean, we know that two thirds of women get off a benefit within four years mm. if they're on the domestic purposes benefit. Mm. Um, you know, the statistics around this just don't add up. So I think we're seeing, you know, a kind of pressured approach basically from Bennett. Um, and I've been most unimpressed, really, by the, the logic behind it. Claudette, should we be concerned that Paula Bennett seems more focused on ways to disqualify beneficiaries than actually doing a thing about the poverty they live in? Well, you know, it goes back to the, um, the statement that I had made earlier, that, you know, being on a benefit is not a career choice. Yep, being yep. on a benefit is not a lifestyle. Hmm. You know, and... And I'll give you an example. There's quite a large um, um, factory in, you know, down um, Favona Road mm. that advertises for positions. Can't fill them. Yeah. You know, so if we're talking about jobs as well, you know, um, where are the jobs? 
there are a lot of jobs in South Auckland. People yep. just need to cross the street and go in. I, yep. I'm, I don't know why we're not seeing the take up of these positions. You know, over 5,000 jobs being advertised on SEEK mm. as well too, on a range of different um, levels. So, you know, it, is she targeting the beneficiaries? Well, obviously she is. Mm. Do I... Um, you know, do I think that being on a benefit is, is a career choice? No, I don't. Would I want to see people off the benefit? Yes, I would. Do you think this would reduce poverty, though? I mean, cutting people's benefits when they've got so little to begin with. It's not just about cutting um, the benefits and sending them, sending them adrift. I mean, again, in South Auckland, there are a multitude of areas where, um, you know, particularly young, young mums yep, yep. Um, can go to upskill as well, too. But what I want to say is that there are and I alluded to it a little bit earlier, there are a couple of community groups who I am very, very worried about. We are seeing young mums go in at age 16 and they're still in these community groups mm. being upskilled on something age 21 and they've got three children. Mm. Now, if those community groups should be, you know, gearing themselves to be redundant, and they should be gearing themselves to get those young girls either back into education or, or into some type of training or into mahi. Mm. But what we're seeing, girls staying in, on the books of these community groups for up to three years, three children later. That is just <coughs> appalling. How much of a problem do you think the low minimum wage is? I mean, if, if, if someone's looking at themselves and saying, well, I'm going to get this amount on welfare, but the amount, the, the extra I'm getting when I go working is actually a pittance. Shouldn't we be trying to push the, the minimum wage up so that there's actually an incentive? Yeah, I think so. I, you know, I, I absolutely agree with that. What you're seeing as well too um, in Māngere is f families, you know, working mums who are, who are working three and four jobs. Yep, mm. yep, yep. As well yep. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with you wage. on that because yeah. I've actually, I taught at Manukau Institute of Technology as well, so I am familiar with those kids. Um, on that particular factory example, I mean, I don't know about that particular factory, but I find that argument quite bizarre, given that there was a supermarket that advertised uh, for jobs and got over 2,000 applicants um, last year. So I think that that is, is somewhat maybe distorting the situation, but I think... No, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm not distorting the situation. And, you know, there is another one on Mahunga Drive. And I went in there and asked the, you know, the yeah. CEO of, Ma of this factory on Mahunga Drive why he had so many um, vacancies and he said very difficult to fill and in fact they were coming in from West Auckland because they couldn't fill them from people within South Auckland. Did you but, ask them about the skills needed or? Oh, look, um, of course I asked, you know, of course, look, there is... There is no end of ability of the people to be able to fill these roles. It's not rocket science. Question you know, to both these, of you. These are factories and they don't need to be rocket science. So I'm sorry, but there are jobs. Na name one thing, uh, either one of you, that Paula Bent has announced that will make the life of beneficiary in poverty slightly less miserable. What, I don't think there said? is anything at the moment, to be honest. Anything? Well, you know what? I think that there are a lot of young girls out my way that will um, appreciate the pill. But well, a final question, <laughs> that's a good point. Moving on. Uh, thank you, panel. Moving on with issue three. Today, at the invitation of Māori King, Māori from across the spectrum gather to hui on water rights in the attempt by the government to sell assets off before those interests are finalised. From day one of this, John Key seems to have mishandled every response. He initially attacked the claim by the Māori Council, attacked the manner of the tribunal, told the media he could ignore any decision and then demanded the tribunal hurry up the decision he had already informed us that he could ignore. Claudette, does John Key need some new Māori friends to help explain to him the importance of, of, of water to Māori? Has the Prime Minister been poorly advised? Yeah, well, um, I think that, you know, there are, you know, the, the water claim was one that was had back when um, Roger Douglas yep. had privatised, yep. you know, had gone through all those private, that privatisation yep. and the assets and the Māori Council had taken the claim on water right. and the claim on spectrum yeah. um, through the tribunal back then. So yep. it's not as though it's an old issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And really, the government should have seen that Māori are gearing themselves and have been for all this time mm. to make a claim on water. And, you know, we've seen now that Ngāpohi is also making a claim on wind. That's right. Well and, and that's being driven by the privatisation agenda. So should yeah. he have embarked upon it, not having all of these things lined up? It seems like it's been poorly handled. 
Well, I think in terms of Māori, um, the Māori perspective, mm. absolutely, they would say it's been poorly handled. They would, Māori would say that they should have been consulted from the go-get mm. around the whole privatisation. And, and also, too, what... Um, what the media are doing as well too are talking about Shares Plus mm, and that's detracting mm. from the conversation and the discussion that Māori are wanting to have around the actual asset do you as think, well do you, too. Do you think a lot of Pākehā understand no. the, the, the relationship Māori have with resource? Do they, do they understand it or is it too to be on the very limited sense of ownership that the, well, the, the Europeans have. Yeah, well, you see, that that's when, you know, the, that Tanifa stuff gets chucked into the conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. as well, too. And then that sort of, like, puts us into that, you know, really kind of weird, um, you know, spiritual basket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, Māori, um, e, the iwi leaders forum, are, are talking about the asset, uh, the economic benefits that can be generated around these assets. And yeah. that's where Māori want to be con um consulted on the benefits and the economic developments around that, mm. a, around the wind as well too, and around the spectrum. Actually, it was interesting that Napo, he brought up the claim on the wind first because the next big issue, the next big claim really is around the spectrum. Yes, that's right. Uh, Phoebe, how does John Key uh, get out of the situation he's in uh, at the moment? Can he push ahead with asset sales or does he have to give it up? I think he has to wait, and it's um, clear that it will be delayed, I think, for quite a bit longer. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's going to be the results of the hui, yep. um, but I think that it is actually damaging the price of the shares as well. And we've sure. had economists come out and saying that. Um, we've also had economists from Auckland University saying that there is no clear logical reason to sell. Sure. Um, so I think that the, you know, the effects of this is that this is poorly managed, poorly planned, and, you know, uh, I think disregarding the Māori Council was a really bad move. Mm. Yeah. I think also too it allows the rest of New Zealand to join in on the conversation yeah. that they weren't allowed to have earlier mm. as sure. well yeah. too. Sure. So sure. if anything else, you know, um, so while Pākehā, just, while there's a significant number of Pākehā who disagree with Māori's claim, mm. what it is allowing now is for all New Zealand to come yeah. back in on the conversation mm. around the sale of the Should assets. John Key have made himself available for the hui? I mean, just, just out of hand refusing to go and not having his own Māori MPs go, just, it seems churlish. Well, you know, um, King Tu Heitia called the hui, yeah. it was a national Māori hui. Yep, yep, and, yep. Um, it was a national Māori hui. Yep. It wasn't a national government hui. Gotcha. So yep. if, a, if, if a party wanted to show up, they can show up. Mm. But at the end of the day, this was a hui for Māori katoa, mm. um, i rotoi te motu. Yep. To but would, go to yep. discuss. But wouldn't it have just been smart politics to have just gone and listened? Sure, you may, you may not agree with what's being said, but it would well, be polite. I mean, the, when, when the Māori yeah, came well, calls, right. I mean, shouldn't yeah. you turn up? Well, now for he might disagree with that. <laughs> 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 yes, there are some of Nāpu that might disagree. There are some of Naito who that might disagree with. And some of um, sure, Nāsi sure, Shinoi sure, that sure, might disagree sure, with sure. that as well too. However, yeah, I... Um, Tainui, yep. Waikato Tainui, do absolutely feel snubbed by right. um, the Prime Minister not showing up. Uh, final question to both of you. Uh, will this go to trial? If it does, who, who, who's going to win? What's your call? Well, I think there's a strong Māori legal case, yes. Mm, mm. So, and, and, and you think they've got a chance to win? I think they do, yes. Would uh, Key's reaction to that, a, a, a victory in court, would that be to simply legislate over the top of it? I think there's going to be um, lots of discussions going on around that right now. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, are, are we going to see a trial? Will they win it? Um, yes, they will win it. And yes, I, I, you know, we might see the same thing that happened with Labour and to see Bed for sure, and we might just see legislation. Wow. Eight, confiscations are so 18th century, aren't they? Uh, Phoebe, your final word this week? Uh, my final word has to be again on the Immigration Amendment Bill. I yeah. uh, was really disappointed to see Q&A this weekend um, and just the absolute lack of justification for those policies and the idea that we need to be aligned with Australia. I saw yesterday uh, the ads that Australia had been taking out in Pakistan um, that say don't jump on uh, a boat to Australia. Um, <laughs> Which uh, I saw actually this photo that was taken in front of a uh, Shia protest where people have been killed. I mean, just the ridiculousness of it. I don't think we should be aligned with Australia. They, though, you know, they have detention centres for children, and I really worry about that. Claudette, your final word this week. Well, yes, actually, and it's got nothing to do with um, politics per se, but I do want to give a really big plug to the m best event ever, the most magnificent event ever in New Zealand and it's on in February next year and it's 
the Tamatatini Kapahaka. And this is where you see the most extraordinary sporting and cultural event. It's a performing arts event, the best Kapahaka teams, but there is, um, you know, there is great sporting, you know, eye-hand coordination, fabulous singing, origin originality of music, of writing, um, performances, beautiful spectacle, wonderful food, huge, huge number of people go along. It's in Rotorua. <laughs> Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, Claudette. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, to my final words. So benefits will cost us $78 billion over the lifetime of the beneficiary, will they? It cost $800,000 to write this report and comes after news that National have spent a billion on consultants so far, which begs the question, how much more will National cost us in consultants over the lifetime of a beneficiary? The $78 billion cost is supposed to fill the public with disgust and greenlight the vast new changes about to be announced to welfare next week. The government will pass welfare along to corporate businesses who will then use all the new disqualification powers to kick thousands off of welfare. The sudden impact of thousands off welfare, of welfare recipients being kicked off welfare is going to cause our communities to implode. The private prison industry will be the only ones happy with that result. Paula will do to welfare next week what National have done to ACC, create a system that finds ways to cut people off rather than work as a public service for their well-being. If you like tonight's show, please join our Citizen A Facebook site and connect with other like-minded new citizens and follow me on my Citizen Bomber Twitter and Facebook page. Thanks for watching, Fana. Good night, Aotearoa. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.